From the History Yogi podcast, this is Dave. In September this year, the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia announced the AUKUS Security Pact, which includes an agreement to provide Australia with nuclear-powered submarines. This development has been both welcomed and criticised by countries in the Indo-Pacific region. Today, we speak to Dr. Ewan Graham, Senior Fellow for Asia-Pacific Security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, on what's the rationale for AUKUS, the reactions of China and ASEAN nations, and what AUKUS means for Singapore. Thanks so much, Ewan, for joining me this morning. What is AUKUS in a nutshell? Well, good morning, Dev. It's nice to be back with you again. The simplest way to explain AUKUS, according to the three governments' own version, is that it's a, a tripartite strategic technology sharing arrangement. That's what it is. I think it's also worth saying up front a couple of things about what it isn't. It's not a treaty and it's not an alliance. And if it's been described as such, that's, that's really a, a misnomer because this isn't a, a stepping up to a, a new kind of pact. It has significance, but it is a close arrangement between three already very close allies and is particularly focused on the nuclear propulsion sharing arrangement for Australia's future submarine. But there are three other elements, broader elements to it, including artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and cyber. So by that measure, it's not just a, an undersea Navy to Navy agreement, but something that's uh, broader and intergovernmental. But I think the strategic aspect to it is important, uh, that this is something that's focused primarily on, on military capabilities and on civilian capabilities that can assist military capability. Australia's deal to acquire US nuclear-powered submarines has garnered the most attention. Why is this so significant? Well, n- nuclear powered submarines are, there's a small club of operators around the, the globe. Australia, it succeeds in this endeavor, will be the only operator of a nuclear powered submarine without nuclear weapons. So that shows just how un- unusual this step is. Nuclear powered submarines have been around a long time. The US first introduced its USS Nautilus in 1954. But the technology has come a long way since then, and it's very closely protected by the governments uh, concerned because it gives a, a step change in, in performance that is really a big strategic leap in terms of endurance, size, speed, and these other things. It also got an understandable amount of attention because Australia was five years into a contract with the French defence company, Naval Group, to produce a conventionally powered large submarine to replace its, uh, its current fleet of six diesel electric submarines. And of course, France's reaction has been one of very vocal anger to that at, uh, at the highest levels. So I think for that reason as well, it's blown up into something more than it was intended to be and, and become a, a transatlantic security issue to deal with um, for for Washington and and for Europe. What is America's strategic interest in AUKUS and the nuclear submarine deal? Well, the United States is the the main military power in the Western Pacific with a network of alliances, all of which are unique and have different strengths and different weaknesses. The United States is, if you like, the status quo power, and it's under challenge from growing and revisionist China that is rapidly improving its own military capabilities. So from that bird's eye viewpoint, what the United States wants and needs is a broader coalition-based approach to maintain a balance of power which will maintain that status quo. 
So I think that's the, the, the primary lens through which I view it, that this is a, it's really about maintaining the balance of power by enabling its allies in the Western Pacific, in this case, Australia, to develop a, a step change in, in uh, deterrence capability. And it's only eight submarines that we're talking about. Australia is a, a country of limited size and limited means. The United States operates well over 50 submarines, all nuclear. China has a mixed fleet of conventional and nuclear submarines, currently around 60 boats. So Australia is a fairly small player by that yardstick. But this is a significant capability. And I think in an alliance context, this deal is a doubling down by both capitals, Canberra and Washington, because it will bind them into a very intense, high resource technology sharing agreement for the next 20 or 30 years ahead. And then of course, to operate together much more beyond that. And there are some other things that are happening on the sidelines of this too, that are worth uh, flagging. It's not just AUKUS and the, and the nuclear submarine deal. Australia has also acquired some quite significant strike capabilities, which include Tomahawk, land attack, cruise missiles, the long range air to surface missiles. And it seems likely that the US force posture in Australia will also be augmented in the, uh, in the short to medium term ahead. So in that broader context, what we're seeing is an ally that is acquiring more, more military heft within the alliance, but at the same time that is doubling down on that alliance commitment as its long-term bet. And that comes back again to the balance of power rationale. Australia is doing that because Australia can't maintain a favorable balance without the United States and vice versa. So that's why we're seeing this acceleration of, of military momentum within, within the US alliance. Since the announcement, some ASEAN countries such as Indonesia and Malaysia have expressed concern, while others like the Philippines have reacted positively. Why is ASEAN split in its response to AUKUS? I don't think it's a surprise that there is a range of views within ASEAN because ASEAN has been very publicly split on uh, the other key issues before it, including uh, how to deal with the Myanmar crisis and how to deal with South China Sea and, and China more broadly as a strategic challenge. So the split is, is a fact of life. Having said that, I don't think it's uh, surprising that there should be some concerns on the part of Southeast Asian countries, including Indonesia. It is, after all, Australia's neighbour, and it must take account of any increase in, in military capability, especially one that's going to be passing through Indonesian waters in, in future. And that is a consistent policy on the part of Jakarta. But I think there's a range of views in Southeast Asia amongst countries that recognize the broader value of maintaining a balance of power in the region. And that was reflected in the Philippine foreign minister's statement, which in very unusual terms for an, for an ASEAN country, clearly referred to the, the rationale in terms of the balance of power and not just Australia's sovereign right to develop the capabilities that it feels it needs to maintain its own deterrence and nas national interest, but also reflecting on ASEAN's inability in aggregate to maintain its own balance of power. And on that, it comes really down again to the fundamental question, which is this, this is happening in a reactive mode, given the very intense modernization that China has made into its own military, and including in the South China Sea, introducing not just nuclear-powered submarines, but nuclear missile launching submarines, uh, which are based in Hainan. So I think for the countries that have a geopolitical tradition, and I would include in that Singapore and uh, Vietnam, and I think the Philippines too is reflective of that statement. 
understand that there there is a, a a need to maintain balance because balance is is the primary ingredient of stability other countries and within countries you also have a, a variety of views too that logic isn't isn't automatically accepted and because nuclear i think has a particular voodoo quality because anything nuclear gets an outsized level of attention there was i think a a confusion about whether nuclear power nuclear propulsion could be linked to nuclear proliferation and the acquisition of nuclear weapons that would obviously be a, a major an altogether quantum leap in, uh, in in strategic capability but the australian government was very clear in its announcement saying that it has no intention to, to develop nuclear weapons or to put nuclear weapons uh, on these submarines if this is about uh, nuclear power. One of the interesting parts of the of the arrangement is that, according to the the design of of um, submarine reactors produced by the UK and the United States, they have a a one one shot load of nuclear fuel which can last throughout the operational life of their uh, nuclear submarines, which is about thirty years. So in theory. Australia will acquire nuclear submarines without control of the nuclear fuel cycle because it won't need to do that. The nuclear reactors will be loaded elsewhere and then at the end of their lives disposed uh, either in the United States or, or, or Australia. But Australia won't need to actually produce the fuel itself or tamper with the, the reactors. It will still need a, a major support industry to safely maintain uh, nuclear power because uh, nuclear reactors are uh, uh, of course a, you know a very sensitive technology and i think that's rattled some nerves within asean asean has a south has a southeast asian nuclear weapons free zone as well so i think there are uh, some demands for reassurance from australia on that uh, but i don't think that's a showstopper for australia my impression is that canberra is prepared to offer ASEAN countries some uh, reassurance on that, uh, that it, it is going to maintain its, its commitments under the Non-Proliferation Treaty and that it can respect nuclear weapons, free zone provisions in both ASEAN, Southeast Asia and, and in the South Pacific. Now, speaking of China, Australia's relations with China have been at their worst in decades and China has reacted angrily to the new AUKUS deal. Why is it specifically upset about it? I don't know that it is specifically upset. I think China is generally upset. And that's part of the, the, the calculation, I think, on the Australian side. Threat is measured according to capability and intent. And I think part of what has caused Australia to make this dramatic decision is that it, it feels... China is not just ramping up its uh, naval and military capabilities, but it's also acting in a more hostile manner. It's subjected Australia to a very significant campaign of economic coercion over the last year. Diplomatic relations are frozen. There is a lot of invective directed at Australia through state media in, in China. And China's behavior towards uh, other countries, including India, Taiwan and the, and the Southeast Asian countries, all of them are feeling, I think, an increased assertiveness and shading into aggression. And that's occurred in the teeth of a, of a global pandemic. China's uh, reaction to AUKUS, I think, is, is quite um, predictable at the official level. Uh, it, it has, I think, tried to increase the doubts of other countries in the region that this will uh, set off a chain reaction resulting in a nuclear uh, proliferation. It is also warned of, of an arms race. And I think that those are designed to play on fears in Southeast Asia in, in particular. And we've seen that language used, for example, in Malaysia in regard to the, the danger of, a, of an arms race. I think just to concentrate a bit more on China's reaction, at the military level, I don't know what China will do, but the logical response will be to continue to 
improve its own anti-submarine warfare capabilities, which it is already doing, but now there is an extra impetus to try and close the gaps because in military terms, while China's People's Liberation Army has come a long way very quickly, submarines and undersea warfare are one sector where the United States and its allies still enjoy a significant advantage. That's also important to understand for why this decision has been taken, because submarines are more stealthy, they're more survivable, they can go long distances. And I think the the official reaction from China is one of opposing this and trying to, I think, plan on uh, play on fears. But the private reaction is probably the more important one because the ultimate purpose of this is not to go to war or to make war more likely, but to introduce doubt into the minds of of China's national leaders uh, about the risks involved in using force to settle uh, their own disputes and ambitions. And if, uh, if Australia acquiring nuclear submarines in future makes it less likely that China decides to take the risk of military coercion against Taiwan or others, then that would be a a, a success. However, there is a risk that the long interval required to develop this capability, and it's unlikely that the first boat will enter service until the very late 2030s at the earliest. So the window in which China might choose to jump through could be earlier than that. And there's no easy answer to that. I think that is a, a a, a dilemma that, that the United States and all of its allies and partners have. But if they don't increase their own capabilities, that's also potentially destabilizing because uh, China will uh, enjoy a military uh, advantage in the shorter term, which might also embolden a, an adventurist foreign policy. Closer to home, Singapore has close defense ties with all three nations that are part of AUKUS. What are some implications for our strategic considerations? Well, I think the reactions from Singapore, from from the Prime Minister and uh, and Foreign Minister and and other quarters, has been, I think, anticipated that there is a level of caution that this is not being welcomed as a an unalloyed good for for Singapore or the or the region. But I think there's also that tradition of understanding the value of of the balance of power, which continues to inform Singapore's thinking on these these issues. But when we last spoke, it was about the five power defense arrangements. And we were talking there about the value of of that to Singapore and, and Malaysia as the two Southeast Asian members. Australia and the UK are of course uh, also members of the five power defense arrangements. So AUKUS is not an alternative to the FPDA, but it it is a a clear signal of increased commitment on the part of the UK to regional security in general. So I don't think Singapore would be unhappy with that. What they want is, is the FPDA to continue its relevance. We're just about to have a set of anniversary events and activities and a major exercise as well. And it remains an important part of of Singapore's defence policy and and strategic settings. I think the broader diplomatic point that Singapore is mindful of is it doesn't want minilateral arrangements to cut across ASEAN centrality. So Singapore's attitude to to the Quad has been cautious for precisely that reason because they see this as something occurring at a level beyond ASEAN and out of its control in a way that could potentially undermine uh, ASEAN's long-standing role as the, as the hub organization for regional security uh, arrangements and dialogue. And I think the same fear is, is likely to be felt about AUKUS, that this is, uh, again, at a kind of stratospheric level, something beyond over ASEAN's head. So it's important for Australia and the United States and the UK to reassure Singapore and the other countries of Southeast Asia that this is not the case, that it's not an either or, but rather this is a complementary set of frameworks, mini-lateral 
which are stitching together the regional regional security in a, a different way to, to how it's been done un, under ASEAN, but in acknowledgement of ASEAN's inability to do that itself. And that's, I think, the where the rubber meets the road because ASEAN member states understand that themselves. We saw the, the Philippines statement as being the most public statement of support for AUKUS and the, and the nuclear submarines. Singapore will, will also, I think, understand uh, that the limitations of that. But as a small state, it is particularly sensitive to anything that undermines potentially the, the broader role of, of ASEAN within its foreign policy. So that's a diplomatic point as opposed to a, a military strategic one. But I think the, the, the two things tend to rub up against each other and, and create a certain amount of tension in Singapore's own security and defense and foreign outlook because the you can't have the two things at, at, at the same time but that's the uh, that's the challenge is is to i think give this time to settle in that that is another way in which i think we've seen previously that uh, once new frameworks are announced there is an initial reaction and then over time they can become part of an accepted part of the fabric. And there may even be the, the time honored plus partner arrangement, I think, for the Quad to bring in other Southeast Asian countries. And the Quad, interestingly, is moving into broader non military, non security areas of public policy, such as vaccines, climate change, supply chains. And that is. Uh, Possibly a, a division of labor that's emerging, whereas AUKUS is, is, is more of the kind of military technology sharing agreement between these three uh, very close allies, whereas uh, the Quad becomes a much higher level and broader based mechanism for addressing these uh, transnational uh, issues in a more positive and cooperative light. And I think that's the kind of, it's a sensible division of labor, if that is the case, because it's likely to allay fears of Singapore and other Southeast Asian countries that the US and its allies are not only thinking about the military strategic dimension, but addressing these broader areas of, I, I don't like the term non-traditional security, but that's the, the way it's referred to, the other things that bind the region together, especially in the post-pandemic phase when public health is still going to be the number one issue that governments in, in the region are under pressure to, to perform on. So that's, I think, uh, uh, important. AUKUS will not go into that broader area, but AUKUS does have non-military potential too uh, in these other areas of, around uh, quantum computing and uh, cyber and artificial in intelligence. So the final point I'll just make on this is, is about the signal that Orca sends. And I think that the Singapore has a close security relationship with the United States, as well as with the FPDA countries. It's the most important security relationship that Singapore has. So indirectly, the value to Singapore of AUKUS is this is a strong vote of interest and confidence on the part of Washington in its Western Pacific Alliance network. Uh, Washington is doubling down on Australia, but there will be indirect benefits from that. And I think after the nervousness of the botched Afghanistan evacuation, AUKUS, probably by intention, fills some of that, that vacuum and is intended to send a positive message, which also triggers concerns on the part of some countries, but it is emphatically a statement of, of interest in maintaining the alliance system and maintaining the balance of power and into the bargain, a strong and active US presence in the Western Pacific. Earlier, we touched uh, on America's and China's strategic considerations. Does America's move to boost its alliance in the Western Pacific mean that chances of conflict with China are higher than ever before, as some people claim? Before I answer that, I should also say it's not only the Western Pacific, uh, it is also the Indian Ocean. 
So uh, Australia has only one submarine base, which is near Perth on the Western seaboard, HMAS Sterling. And uh, if as part of this arrangement, we start to see more US submarines and potentially UK submarines being given increased basing access to HMAS Sterling, then that will also increase the relevance for India and all countries with a with a, an Indian Ocean, Eastern Indian Ocean security interest, which includes Singapore too, of course. As to your, your question, this is really a, a version of the security dilemma. Is this going to make conflict more likely or less likely? Well, um, let's just think through how that might happen. It might make it less likely if it changes the, changes the the calculation of military risk on Beijing's part. If they see that the US alliance structures are becoming stronger and that there is an incipient coalition which is beginning to form, in part because Beijing has pushed its own weight around unnecessarily in the past few years, and that this is a, a counter reaction. I'm not sure that Beijing will view it that way because I don't think Beijing is quite capable of self critiquing its own behavior to that extent. But the, the professional military planners of, of the PLA do understand the military balance and they understand the value of nuclear submarines and they understand that this is an area where, where the US and allies still have a, a capability edge. And if countries like Australia are going to acquire the capability to operate and loiter undetected in waters that are close to China, where their forces are concentrated and most vulnerable, and that infrastructure on land, including military bases, is potentially held at risk as part of that calculation, then that should have a deterring effect because Xi Jinping is not an impulsive character from everything that we know about him. He's ideological in frame of mind, but also cautious in the way that uh, he makes decisions. And I think if the military risk is laid before him as in increasing, then that may be a positive. The whole purpose of this is to increase uh, the, the deterrence of the US uh, and its allies. But as I said earlier, the, the counterfactual to that is that this capability is, is 15 years or more in the future, and Australia only has six aging diesel submarines as the mainstay of its maritime deterrent capability. So the unintended consequence would be if Beijing concludes that they have a window and that window is going to close very rapidly in the 2030s and that the time to lock in strategic gains comes in this decade. And I think that in the nature of the security dilemma, there is no uh, magic solution to that. But I think the, the broader point is that this is a step change, not just in military capability. It's also, it's an acknowledgement that the security environment is getting worse and that the risk of conflict is getting higher. And the best way to prevent war is to prepare for it as responsibly as possible and to maintain diplomatic reassurance and connections and communications as far as possible, but to do so from a position of, of strength nationally and at the alliance level. And AUKUS, I think, is an attempt to, to firm that, that position up. How Beijing reacts to it is a, a black box, and it, it will be subject to not just the military balance, but also domestic political factors in, in China's own calculation. And I don't think that those can be influenced very effectively from the outside. What can be influenced is the, the military balance and the balance of risk. And eight submarines acquired by Australia is not going to be a threat to China in any fundamental sense. So I don't think that accusations of, of an arms race can be taken at face value. Beijing will continue to do what it is doing, which is to build out its, its current level of, of capabilities. But it will have to take account of the US-Australia alliance 
in a broader sense, including what the United States does in and from Australia in future as uh, part of the balance of power calculation. Thank you.